to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ we walk by faith not by sight 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Welcome to our study of the book of 2 Corinthians. This book, Paul is dealing with his defense, having the right to be an apostle, and he's offering some various encouragements to the churches that he's writing to or to the church in Corinth. In chapters 1 through 4, we have faith. We walk by faith in the promises of God, who He is, and what He's promised us in His Word. Now in chapters 5 through 7, we walk by faith in the plan of God. And that plan takes us back to the very beginning of time. God, before time began, had planned a way to save man. Titus 1 verse 2, 1 Peter 1 verses 18 through 19. This chapter especially 2 Corinthians 5 will show us how God's plan uniquely ties together in motivating and encouraging and offering salvation to the child of God. As we think about this, Paul begins 2 Corinthians 5 by making a point that we've got to keep focused on heaven if we're going to realize the ultimate plan of God. Part of God's plan in salvation is for us to have that home and place we call heaven. But to do that, you've got to distinguish between this earthly house and our heavenly home. You've got to realize between the temporary and the eternal, between what's important and what's not important. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Paul says, since in verse 18 of chapter 4, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. He then says in chapter 5, verse 1, We know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul says in chapter 4, our light affliction is just but for a moment. It's temporary. We don't look at that which is temporary, but that which is eternal. And then he says, for if our house this body is destroyed we have a heavenly home not made with hands friends if we're going to have faith in and if we're going to be true to the plan of God we've got to realize that this earthly life our body is not what's really what really life is about oh it's true we walk in the flesh we live in the flesh but we don't fight a fleshly battle. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 teaches us our battle is a spiritual battle. And while we do have to live in this physical temporary shell, it's not what's important. It's not what mas masters me. I must master it. And I must realize that my heavenly home is the most important of all things. In Hebrews chapter 11, the saints of old, they look for that city whose builder and maker was God, heaven itself. Revelation 21, the encouragement is also offered to Christians not to focus here on the earth, but rather to focus on heaven. Revelation 21 verses 1 through 4, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more sorrow, crying, death, tears. All the former things have passed away. In view of all that, how we need to put worldliness and materialism aside and focus on godliness. James 4 verse 4 teaches us the danger of worldliness. James says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not realize that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. You can't have the best of both worlds. You can't live it up in this old earthly house, in this body, and have every fun and pleasure you want and somehow still think you're going to go to heaven. You've got to focus on the eternal, on heaven itself. Paul gives us the right mindset. In Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ, 
and to die is gain. Living for Jesus is what this life is about and death is only a benefit. To do that, we've got to follow the words of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. But you know, to go home, to really have that, that groaning, you've got a desire to have the proper clothing in this life. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. He says, In this we groan, not that we want to be uh, further clothed, but rather be clothed with the eternal things. We've got to desire in this life to be clothed with the eternal promises and the eternal plan of God. Friend, our clothing initially begins as we obey the gospel. Galatians 3 verse 27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. That clothing in this life is what we live that is pure and holy. It's been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And ultimately, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, will be changed, the Bible says, from an immortal to immortal, from incorruptible or from corruptible to incorruptible. We'll be made like Jesus. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21, our body will be in that sense. And while we may not understand all of that, don't you groan and don't you desire to be clothed with that kind of body, to be clothed in heaven itself? Don't you get tired of the aches and the pains and all the things that go along with this temporary shell? And don't you one day want to put that off and have a home and a body that will never fade away. That's what God has promised us. And again, we don't claim to know all the details of that. We're not saying at all that we do, but we do know this. God's given us that promise, and it's something we ought to desire more than anything to have. And so we groan for that heavenly home more than anything. That's where we want to go. Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 22, I'd like to stay here and help you, but I'd rather really go and be with the Lord, which is far better. Did Paul want to stay and help Christians go to heaven? Absolutely. But he said, I've got a better desire, which is to go and be with the Lord. Our groaning must be more than anything to go home. Revelation 14, verse 13, the Bible says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Friend, I want you to think real seriously for a moment about this plan of God, His plan for us to go home with Him one day. And I want you to ask yourself this. Do you desire to stay here on this earth more than you desire to go to heaven? Think about that. If it came to it right now and you had a choice to make and the choice was stay here or go to God, go to heaven, what would your choice be? You know, sometimes that would be a difficult choice. We'd say, well, I'd like to go to heaven in a few years. I'd like to go to heaven after I've lived out a full life. I'd like to go to heaven after I've accomplished these things. Our mindset cannot really be that way. We've got to groan more than anything and desire to go home with God at any moment if we're really going to partake in the plan that God has so richly blessed us with. And so we've got to have the, the mindset of being homesick for heaven. Look in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6. Notice the attitude of Paul. Paul said we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We need to have the, the feeling of being homesick. You ever gone on a, a long trip? Maybe you had a son or a daughter who was in war and they went across the ocean to the other side and they were gone for a long time. Don't you remember that homesick feeling? You've been gone too long and you desire to sleep in your bed, to sit at your table, to be a part of that residence again. That feeling of being homesick is the idea we ought to have concerning heaven. We ought to be homesick for heaven more than anything else. Have a desire to go there and be with God more than to stay here. But to do that, we've got to walk by faith and not by sight. I've never seen heaven. I've never seen Jesus. I've never seen God. But my faith is, by the, is the way in which I know that they exist and that that heavenly home exists. I want you to look again at the words of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. It's a very simple statement, but look at the importance of it. Paul says, we walk by faith not by sight. We've got faith that our body's going to be changed. We've got faith in that heavenly home. We've got faith in the Savior and God in the Bible. Well, what does that mean we walk by faith? It, does that mean that it's just a leap into the dark and all there, there's no evidence? We've got this warm, fuzzy feeling deep down and we go, oh, there's a God and I just feel it? 
No, that's not what it means to walk by faith. How does a person, according to Scripture, walk by faith? What is faith? Is faith that warm, fuzzy feeling, that leap into the dark, and although we have no evidence, in just a superstitious way, we just say, well, I feel it. God's there. I feel it. Is that faith? No. Faith is always based on evidence. It's something that is sustainable, and it's something you can be sure of. Now, how is it that we can have faith in God and Christ in heaven when we've never seen any of those things? Because God has given us ample evidence to know they exist and to put our trust in them through the Word. How do we get faith? Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And my friends, it's impossible to please God without faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6. And so as we talk about walking by faith, we're talking about walking by the teachings found in the Bible. I get faith as I read and understand, as I study the character, the nature of God, as I look at His promises and His dealings with man. Throughout the centuries, I can know God hasn't lied. Hebrews 6 verse 18, He cannot change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 8, and thus when we talk about walking by faith, it's not a leap into the dark. It is solid foundation based on the evidence God's given us. Hebrews 11 verse 1, verse 1 says, Faith is substance and faith is evidence. How do we have substance and evidence? Well, I have substance and evidence of God based on His Word, the Bible teaches, and based on the things that He's left for me to know Him. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Look up at night and say to yourself, Wow, what a great marvel of evolution. Oh, you're not going to say that. You look up at the stars at night as they twinkle, as you look at all the many things that have been created, and you're not going to say, well, that is a great accident. No, you're going to say, there's a great God out there who made that. Acts chapter 14, verses 11 through 17, God has not left Himself without witness. He's done good. He's given us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. Look at the change in the seasons, how it always stays constant. That's God doing that. We can know God exists. We can know Jesus came. You can look at the evidence historically in the Bible and you can trust in the inspiration of God's Word. All Scripture is inspired by God and when God says it and we do it, we're walking by faith based on evidence. And so friend, as we talk about the plan of God, this plan is substantial. This plan is something that we can know. It's sustainable and we can be sure about that plan. But here's what else you can be sure of. As we think about the plan of God, you can be sure of this. You've got to live the proper life here and now if we expect to go home and be with God. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 verses 10 and 11. This plan requires that I live my life in harmony with God's will. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Paul says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I trust are well known in your consciences. How is it that we must live a, what encourages us to live a good, holy life? Very simply two things. Number one, I'm going to stand before God, and I'm going to give an account for everything I've done in this life. We must all all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 10, 14 verses 10 through 12. Every action that I've done is going to be judged. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 5. The way I live my life will determine where I go for eternity. God is going to judge us according to the words of Jesus. John 12 verse 48. But notice the second thing that motivates me to live a holy life. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Friend, while we want to emphasize the love and the mercy and the comfort that God brings, you know, we also need to be fair and emphasize how horrible and how terrible it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 verse 29 said, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 and verse 31. Friend, realize that God is a God who gets angry and who deals with sin at times according to His anger. Think about Genesis chapter 6. You want to see what it means to understand the terror and fear of the Lord? 
the world had become very wicked. All except Noah and his family, God was fed up with it, and He said, I'm going to destroy the world. And he sent a flood. And he prepared a way for Noah and his family to be saved, but He sent a flood, and all the known world except Noah and his family drowned because of the anger of God. Think about the rebellion of Korah. Korah and his family decided that Moses and Aaron had too much authority. They were going to take some on themselves, and they needed to be an important family in Israel too. What happened at their rebellion? The ground split open and sucked thousands of them in. My friends, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so based on the judgment that all things are going to be made open, that I'm going to stand before God, the great, small and great are going to stand before God, Revelation 20 verse 12, and that I will be judged according to the way I've lived my life, I need to realize that it is a very fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so this plan, I'm motivated by God's judgment and the fact that God is a God who will punish people if they don't live right. But you know, as we think about God's plan, what's key and central to this plan is the great love that God has for mankind. Yes, it's a fearful thing to fall into God's hand. We need to understand the terror of the Lord, but you know what? We also need to understand the depths of God's love for mankind. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I love the balance of God. Directly after talking about how fearful it is to fall into the hands of the living God, how we need to be afraid of God at times, the Bible also talks about how we need to respect God's love. Verses 14 and 15, Paul says this, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Notice what he says. We judge thus that Christ died for all. The love of Christ compels. The idea is it motivates, it propels us, it pushes us on. Think about God's great love in His plan to save mankind. Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, Christ who lives in me, the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. What was it that motivated Paul? It was the great love of God. Think about what Christ did for me and for you. He, he came and lived a perfect life. He didn't have things of His own. Didn't even have a place to lay His head. People mocked Him and spat at Him and eventually crucified Him. And, and what was it Jesus asked of us? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, Paul, when he said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. My friends, it's only right that we live a sacrifice for Jesus in view of all that He did for us. Stop and think about the love that God has for each individual. John 3, 16, the Bible says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. God loved you and God loved me so much that He sent His Son to he from heaven to this earth to die a horrible death for me. Friend, if that won't motivate, propel you to live for Christ, what will? The love of God is central to His plan in saving man. But you know, this love is what makes the plan possible. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 shows us what the plan is all about, how that we get a second chance in Christ. Aren't you thankful for second chances in life? Well, look at this one, 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to notice the words of verse 17. The Bible says, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. You know, sometimes we make mistakes in life, and sometimes we do things wrong, and sometimes, if we're real lucky, we get a chance to make that right. In God's plan, every man gets a chance to make it right after he's already sinned. You see, all of us have blown it the first time. Romans 3.23, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Our first chance, we've all sinned and we're headed down the road to destruction. But listen to 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. In Christ, in God's plan, you and I, we get a second chance. And how wonderful that is. And how that ought to thrill us with great joy. Paul could say in Philippians 4 verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Why could Paul say that? Why did he exult so much? Here's why. Because Paul used to be Saul. And Saul 
held the coats of those who killed Stephen. Saul was wreaking havoc on the church. Saul was dragging men and women to prison. Some of those were being put to death. Saul was an enemy of Christ. He was given a second chance and how joyful he was for that. And so if we're really going to take part in the plan of God, we've got to realize this is our second chance. How thankful we ought to be for that and realize Jesus is the only reason we have that chance. Verse 21 tells us God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Now friends, as we think about chapter 6 and this same idea of, of God's plan, I want you to understand that walking by faith in God's plan is not something we can take flippantly and it's not something we need to do tomorrow. This is a now matter. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says of God's plan for salvation to save all men, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, We then as workers together with Him plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for He says, In an acceptable time I've heard you, in the day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Did you see that, that word in there that is so important? That little word, now? Salvation is not a tomorrow project. Salvation is not something you do when you've done everything else in life. It is a matter of now. Now why is it so important now? Here's why. James 4 verse 14 says, What is your life? It's but a vapor. Here for a little while, then it vanishes away. It's a now matter because we don't know how long we're going to live. At the best, we've got maybe 70, 80 years, Psalm 90 verses 10 through 12. And you can be sure it's appointed a man wants to die and then the judgment and we have no clue when that's going to be. Well, how do you take advantage of now? You do just like they did in the first century. You obey now what you know now. They cried out in Acts 2 verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was clear. They had to realize Jesus was the Son of God and believe in Him, just as Saul did in Acts 9 verse 6. They have to make the good confession, Acts chapter 8 verses 36 through 38, as the Philippian or the Ethiopian eunuch did. They had to believe and only believe and make that good confession. They had to repent. Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of their sins. And friend, you've got to be baptized to be saved. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. And so as we think about faith in the plan of God, this is not a matter for tomorrow. It's a very important, timely matter. You've got to deal with it now because you have no promise of tomorrow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, one of the things that does, however, restrict us from doing the Lord's will is our own desires and how true that is for each of us. If we said, what is it that's kept me from obeying the gospel? What is it that's kept me from living the Christian life? The top answer would be, well, I'd, I'd like to do this. I've got things and desires that I'm just not ready to give up. Look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 12. Paul says in verse 12, You are not restricted by us. You are restricted by your own affections or desires. What is it that really keeps us from serving God? Well, it's sometimes our love of this world. We can't fully let go of the world to love God. Sometimes it's our greed, like Ananias and Sapphira. They had to keep back some of that money, and it wouldn't let them serve God properly. Sometimes our fear. Our fear of the unknown, our, our fear of letting go and trusting God. Sometimes our anger, anger's an affection. Sometimes our anger won't allow us to forgive completely. Sometimes our anger won't allow us to serve God like we ought to. Sometimes it's our pride, there's another affection. It won't allow us to fully submit to the will of God. But be sure, God's not keeping us from obeying the gospel. If anybody hadn't obeyed the gospel, it's not God's fault. It's our own affections and desires that sometimes get in the way of us doing the will of God. But sometimes it's because we get unequally yoked with unbelievers. Sometimes we get so closely tied to the world that we can't let go and let God. Look at the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 through 17. The Bible says in verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I'll be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, 
Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Part of God's plan, and walking by faith in that plan, means I've got to be separate from the world. God says, come out from among them and be separate. Christians are to be unique. Unique for their righteousness, unique in their speech, unique in the modest dress they wear. In every way, we're to be unique as God's people. We cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But my friends, I want you to understand another very important principle about God's plan. And that is, in God's plan, we need to understand the importance of repentance and what true repentance is. I want you to notice 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In this chapter, Paul deals with repentance and how God does comfort the downcast, verse 6. But I want you to notice 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Look in verses 9 and 10. I want you to notice this. Paul says, Now I rejoice that you are made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Friend, in God's plan, we must be willing to have true repentance. Repentance is not tears alone. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 17, godly sorrow produces repentance. Oh, it's, it's right to be sorrowful, but notice godly sorrow alone is not repentance. John said in Luke chapter 3 verse 8 to certain people who came out to be baptized by him, he said, I want you to go and bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Did they want to obey God? Yes, but had they repented? No. They hadn't brought any fruits. True repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way of life. And so we ask you today, have you changed your life in such a way that you're ready to put the plan of God for you into action? Friend, God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to go to heaven. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. But God won't force or make anybody. He's made the plan. Will you walk by faith in that plan? Have you heard the word? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Will you confess Him before men? And will you be baptized for the remission of your sins? Acts 2 verse 38. Friend, we're hoping and praying to God that you will obey the gospel, that you will be saved, and that you'll walk by faith in view of that heavenly home we've been promised. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.